Ecuadorian embassy in London, where Julian Assange is holed up. He's been here for just over two years, just celebrated his 43rd birthday inside the embassy. Here you can see the uh, British police. Um, and right in front of me is the balcony where Julian Assange has come out and addressed his supporters and addressed the media. The Ecuadorian flag hangs from that balcony. As to when Julian Assange will come out, well, he is concerned if he steps foot outside, he will be arrested by the British police. So for now, he's inside this nomad of the digital age. We're in the Ecuadorian embassy in London, where Julian Assange took refuge two years ago. He's been detained in Britain for close now to four years. Welcome to Democracy Now!, Julian. Thank you, Amy. How are you doing here? It's been over two years that uh, you have really not seen daylight for any extended period of time. There's been nearly four years that I've been detained without charge in one form or another here in the United Kingdom, first in prison, the solitary confinement, then under house arrest for about 18 months, and now uh, two years here uh, in the embassy. The Ecuadorian government uh, gave me political asylum in relation to the ongoing national security investigation by the DOJ, the Department of Justice, uh, in the United States into our publications and also into sourcing efforts. So did I enter into a conspiracy with Chelsea Manning, uh, who was sentenced last year to 35 years in prison? So the, the question as to how I'm doing, of course, uh, personally, it's a difficult situation in a variety of ways. I would say that when someone's in this position, uh, what you are most concerned about is the, the interruption of your family relationships. Uh, so because of this, the security situation, that's made it very hard for uh, my children uh, and my parents. But if we look at the, the, the bigger picture, uh, WikiLeaks as an organization has survived. Uh, that attack by the US government and we've gone on uh, to do further work and some quite significant work. Uh, unlike many e media organizations during that period we have not gone bankrupt despite a, a worldwide extrajudicial uh, banking blockade by Visa, MasterCard, PayPal uh, and so on uh, and none of our members of staff have been fired. So I think if, if you went back and said to yourself what are the chances that a small uh, investigative publisher could publish this information about uh, the Iraq war and the State Department and the Afghanistan war and many other documents about Guantanamo uh, and enter into conflict uh, with the United States government uh, in a very serious way. Uh, would they still be publishing? Uh, would their people be uh, in prison? And you would think probably yes, uh, but actually um, we have managed to uh, o mostly overcome, apart from my situation here, uh, the barriers that have been put up against us. So July 16th is a significant date. You are wanted in two investigations, or you've been, you're being investigated by the U.S. government because, as you said, of WikiLeaks, of uh, exposing many documents, um, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, how many would you say? around the eight, Iraq war. Eight million so far. Eight million around the Iraq war, around the Afghanistan war, and cables of the State Department that go back for decades. You're also wanted by Sweden on for questioning, often misstated as uh, because you've been charged, yeah. for questioning around sexual misconduct. And July 16th is a big date in that case. Why? While most of our resources have been concerned with the ongoing U.S. investigation and pending prosecution, which the, US, which the DOJ admits to in its court filing of the 25th of April this year, uh, continues, um, the Swedish investigation has obstructed my asylum. So the United Kingdom says, look, there's this uh, questioning um, warrant that Sweden has put out for you. They may have dropped the case, which they did, and re-raised it. But nonetheless, there is this questioning warrant. And therefore, we say you cannot go uh, to Ecuador to accept asylum uh, until we've extradited you to Sweden. Now, that is actually a violation of international law. The international law is quite cl clear. Asylum trumps extradition because of the nature of the relationships with the UN and the 1951 Asylum Convention. So. 
every time we try and we get some uh, traction publicly and politically in the US case, people say, oh, no, no, the whole thing is really about the Swedish case. So it's quite important uh, to deal with the Swedish matter uh, and kind of show it for what it is and, and that it should be dropped. Uh, and there has been no movement, although the Swedish gov government is obligated to uh, somehow progress the situation, they've been very happy to keep it in a complete stasis. Uh, they've refused to come here, uh, to speak to me here or pick up a telephone or to accept an affidavit. Uh, they've also refused to provide a guarantee that I will not be extradited to the United States if I offered to go to Sweden. Um, so those, that situation means we have to uh, tackle the uh, Swedish matter, it seems, in Sweden. The only other alternative is perhaps going to the International Court of Justice in relation to the asylum. Anyway, so it will be the first date in uh, nearly four, in four years that uh, the matter has been heard about in Sweden. And my, my lawyers are, are confident that either in the lower court um, and more likely the appeal court, uh, we will be able to dismiss the case because the law is reasonably clear. Um, you're meant to proceed uh, with uh, the Swedish government has an obligation under its own law uh, to proceed with maximum speed, um, with minimum cost, and also with bringing the minimum suspicion uh, on the person who's been investigated. Uh, and it is in clear violation of all those points of law. This hearing that will take place on July 16th is a result of an appeal by your Swedish lawyers. Why didn't they appeal before? Well, several things have happened in the interim. Because of the abuses in this case and some other cases, new European law was introduced and uh, pulled in and enacted in Sweden. And uh, it was meant to be enacted by June of the 1st this year. It wasn't, but by uh, July the 1st, it should have come on board, so just recently. So that new legislation permits uh, people who are suspects, uh, who are, had their liberty deprived in some way, uh, to be able to access evidence that shows that they're innocent. And so um, we understand that there's a significant evidence that was collected by the police that show that I'm, I'm innocent. And they have thus far refused to hand it over, but this new European law means that they have to hand it over. In uh, affidavits that I have read, um, your lawyers were allowed to see text messages um, of the women who have accused you. Um, well, it's hard. To, it's, you have to be careful in saying that they have accused me, because actually, when you when you read uh, their correspondence and their and their, their early statements, they don't say that at all. In fact, they say that they didn't accuse me, and that the police uh, took the matter, and the state accused me that they didn't want uh, any charges, that they weren't filing a formal complaint. That's what they say in those text messages. Um, your lawyers weren't able to get copies of them at this point, but they were allowed to look at them. One of yeah. them saying something like, I did not want to put any charges on Julian Assange, but that the police were keen on getting a grip on him. Yeah, and that she was railroaded into, into things and really did not, uh, she, she did not want uh, what occurred to occur. So you were questioned in Sweden originally, and the chief prosecutor actually, is it the prosecutor who dropped the case against you? The chief prosecutor of Stockholm reviewed the material very early on the case and, and dropped the, um, the rape uh, complaint, uh, dropped it, said there's no, said it's not that I don't believe what the women say, but there's, there's just no evidence that any crime has been committed. And so the matter was dropped. Uh, then subsequently, a, a senior Swedish pro politician, Klaus Borgström, uh, who was running for election, uh, then uh, took it to Gothenburg, a city which has nothing to do uh, with the case, and uh, resurrected it under another prosecutor. Mm. And so what could happen on July 16th? The options for them, uh, they can simply they can dismiss it, um, they can say that the law is unclear and ask um, maybe the European Court uh, of Justice uh, to give clarity on this new European law and how it is to be implemented. There's also a law here that was just passed in Britain that seems to have come about as a result of your case. Unfortunately, you're not protected under it. That's a very important development. So as a result of 
the abuses in my case, which were seen by the Supreme Court. There was a split in the Supreme Court. Um, here in Britain. Here in Britain. And subsequently, the Cambridge Journal of Comparative Law wrote two papers about what, what had happened. And there's a lot of concern about this idea that you could extradite someone without even charging them. Um, so political pressure, there was, there was a backbench revolt in the British Parliament, uh, principally amongst the Conservative backbench, that this was, you know, that any police officer in Europe could just ask for someone in the UK to be extradited without it going before a court, without them being charged. Um, and so new legislation was introduced to prevent that happening. So no, no more extradition without charge from the UK. But um, there was then debate that, well, will this in fact protect Assange? And so a specific clause was entered into it that it will not be retrospective for those people where the court has decided that they will be extradited, but they haven't been extradited yet, which just applies to me. Mm -hmm.